Great. Well, I'm super excited to talk with you about green coffee grading, talk about some of the standards that are you know, sort of captured here by the SCA, wash the uh, green coffee. <laughs> um, before we jump right into it, though, um, let's just do a brief introduction. Um, I'm Marcus Young. A lot of folks um, that have attended some of the Cropster webinars know me um, as I manage education and content and things here. Um, and I'm super excited to be talking about green coffee. So Candace, I'll let you take it away and, and introduce yourself. Oh, introduce myself. Um, I'm Candace. I've been in the industry for about, I don't know, 15 years. I just <laughs> want to be all blurry. Um, I started like a lot of people as a barista, went on really quickly within 18 months um, to get my cue. Um, and uh, became a roaster, um, accidentally a head roaster because my, uh, <laughs> my boss was not interested in teaching me. So I had to call on a lot of resources and those resources are everybody in the community, people like yourself, um, who have enabled me the whole way through my career to cue instructor and judge for competitions where we like spent time together. And um, yeah, I moved from London to New York to California I think I'm going to end up in Alaska or Hawaii or something if I keep spanning the globe that way. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, happily uh, working for myself right now. So that's a new thing. Um, and I'm very excited. I'm terrified. Awesome. <laughs> I, I'm so glad to have a chance for you and I to collaborate here because yeah, as you said, we've worked at competitions and things before. And um, I've followed your work and your career since we first met. And I think we kind of hit it off. Um, so this is really fun, you know, it's, I, I haven't had the, the benefit of taking a Q course from you, but since I'm due to calibrate, maybe, um, maybe we should figure out if we can pick something. I know, I need to hold one of those soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, kind of into our, our topics today, um, I really hope that, you know, as part of our agenda that we can get our attendees to um, participate in some discussion. Um, use the chat, use the Q&A window. I'm gonna to try to keep them open and kind of monitor them as best I can as Candice and I talk. Um, we are gonna have a little bit of a presentation that we'll be going through, but I want that more to be material for discussion rather than the entire purpose of this. Um, and you might see this is a little bit different. I've got a second camera on myself here um, with a stack of green coffee because we also wanna do a little the somewhat informal, but I think accurate demonstration of um, what green grading looks like. And so, you know, some of the topics we'll go through are representative samples, a physical inspection, um, kind of the ideas of green grading. But I also want to make sure that you and I have a chance to talk about the fact that we have these standards that were developed by the SCA and are sort of enforced and tested by CQI and the Q. But I get it, when you're a roaster, when you're a production roaster, we need to be pragmatic and we might have some recommendations for a practical approach with these things. So anything to add, Candice, before we sort of jump into this? No, I mean, I, I don't wanna to talk too much right now um, in terms of, um, uh, um, yes, everything, everything you're saying is important and relevant and, and, and then I'll talk when it's on the screen. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to get ahead of myself, I'll be good. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Me too. I'm so distracted watching myself here and seeing like my hands and my arms on this map. Um, but I, I wanted to start this just by having a little discussion. So I encourage all of our attendees to chime in on the chat or the Q&A if they would like. Um, but in the meantime, I think you and I can both sort of talk through a few of these questions as well, because we both worked as roasters. I'm currently um, you know, helping a few friends with their green buying schemes. So I'm receiving and evaluating samples sometimes. Um, and um, yeah, so, you know, and kind of when, when you were a lead roaster, Candice, like how many samples were you sort of managing over a given um, time? Luckily, I, I, I say luckily, it doesn't mean anything. Um, just, uh, I managed, apart from my workload, um, I managed quite small, Kind of inventory and roasteries. I know friends who have huge libraries and banks of samples that would come in all the time. And what is 
supremely important is to make sure that you have um, either used a code or a library or filing system for these samples and ensure also that they're stored correctly so you're not um, impinging the quality um, that was there with too much sunlight, too much humidity or moisture in the air, um, not putting them next to anything odiferous. And so I had kind of a, a pigeonhole system for mine and my, um, it was kind of a FIFO system. So it was first in, first out, all the, I would get to sample roast the ones that were the oldest basically, whilst managing the ones that were coming in, um, in this pigeonhole system. I, it really doesn't, to me, um, if you're a small roastery or you're managing a small inventory, it doesn't matter so much how you physically um, uh, manage your samples and, and, and file them or, or, what, or however you call it. Um, but uh, it's important that you do. And what's yeah. important, what's the handshake to that is the, the data, like being able to put it into a spreadsheet or what have you. Now Cropster has the system. So, you know, <laughs> I don't really have to do much myself, but um, I, I've done it before. I've mixed up samples before. It's not fun and it takes time, energy and can cost you money. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I've done it too. Um, yeah, and I, most of my experience um, in roasteries has been on a smaller scale. So, right, maybe I'm just managing, you know, sort of samples when I need to make a purchase, right? Like I'm working for a Kenyan coffee right now and I have four samples coming from a supplier I really trust. I'll probably grab a few more um, from another supplier or two. So that's just six coffees. But yeah, I need to keep those organized, right? Because whichever sample I decide to ultimately pursue, I'm gonna to wanna to hold on to that as a reference um, down the line for when the coffee actually arrives in my hands in case there's a problem. Um, yeah, and, exactly. If you can make sure that you have some left over. Um, yeah, I think it's perfect. There are a couple of um, importers that I would love to use, but they send out a hundred gram samples. <laughs> And so I'm like, I, I need some of the green left over for me personally. So, yeah. It's Absolutely. And we'll talk about like the standard, right? I mean, a hundred gram sample is standard. And, and I've been an importer. I've been a coffee buyer and seller for an importer. And I get it. It costs a lot of money. Um, 350 grams, which is what's piled up here, which is the standard also, is a lot. Um, yeah. But... Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, if my sample roaster, if I have a Probot BRZ, you know, that roasts 100 grams pretty well. Yeah. It roasts 150 exceptionally well. Yeah. Um, and it's hard for me to deal with less than about 300, 350 grams just from a practical standpoint if I want to keep a reference on hand to compare each step of a, of a transaction. Yeah, we ended up buying, before the Akawas came out, um, we ended up buying a Quest M3 um, small barrel roaster. It's meant to be a home roaster, but it actually, it, it works, um, you know, reasonably well as a sample roaster and it's less than $1,000. So mm. I used to use that for the really small increments and use our barrel sample roaster. Absolutely. And I, I love the world we're in. I mean, I talk to like new entrepreneurs and and coffee roasters in that startup phase. And, you know, they've budgeted all this money for their shop roaster and they're suddenly hit with like, what? I need another roasting machine? The fact that we have the Quests and the Hookies and these roasting yeah. systems that are quite affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and you can roast out of your house if you need to as a startup person. <laughs> like with a Quest, you can, or if you can afford the Akala, great. But with a Quest as well, both of those, you can literally roast in your house, so. Yeah, and here's somebody coming in saying, you know, like a Loring S7 can roast a one pound sample. Yeah, yeah that's a lot though. One pound is 454 grams, right? Yeah. So if I come and only have 150 grams, you know, I, I know that like our buddy, um, Mark Michelson, he can, you know, he likes to show that he's roasting 100 grams on his social media feed on all these different roasting systems. Um, and you can do it. But I don't know that I'm able to meet the standards for sample roasting consistently with- That's it. It's like, at the end of the day, if I'm buying a coffee, that's me putting, like that that would be me putting cash into a roasting machine. So I need to know that it's going to give me what I need out. And that's the only kind of real danger 
that you'll end up roasting in such a way that you assume the coffee's quality is one thing and it's another. Yeah, exactly. And it happens. And I think, you know, having a system then to provide feedback to suppliers is important. I mean, you mentioned the kind of old school way, right? Which was maybe a spreadsheet. Um, I'm old enough that we used to like scan or fax cupping forms back to suppliers. Um, but, you know, we'll look at like some screenshots from Cropster, of course, because this is a Cropster webinar. Um, and we'll be able to see how really that's, we have how a system. So long ago. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, we, we're talking about samples and, you know, there is this idea of a representative sample, right? Representative, of course, means that the sample that we receive should represent the bulk of the coffee that I am buying. Um, can you share a little bit kind of from the perspective of SCA, CQI, what, what, what are the standards for a representative sample? Um, it's 350 grams. And so I think most people who are used to working within the protocol um, expect that it's 350 grams from 10% of the lot. So you really need to, and I think Marcus and I, we were talking about this earlier, you really need to ensure that you have those parameters provided to you. Um, if you have five, 10 gram, a 10 bag um, a shipment, I honestly want a sample from, from each of those bags because yeah. um, not that I'm saying anyone is duplicitous or doing things that are naughty. I'm just saying that it's very easy to take a, a, you know, a sample from this bag, which is great and you've sorted really well and not give me a sample from this bag. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, Even if I just right. think about two pallets of coffee, right, like on a container, well, if some of those bags were right up against the door of the container and others are sort of buried in the middle, exactly. you know what, I want to see, like, what do the bags that were more exposed taste like versus the bags in the middle, so a representative sample would be a mixture of, of all of that, and, you know, and, and at the importer level, right, this, you know, they're of course getting a, a representative sample that that is probably several packs, so that they can then send samples of that out to roasters to buy. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's um, it's tough and it's important um, mm -hmm. for all those reasons. And it it's one of those things. It's like you know, people always like to throw out around the term middleman or complain about paying like warehousing fees and carry costs. But boy, when I think about a warehouse that's being asked to go and here's a container of coffee, right? Maybe 320 bags from Ethiopia and some poor workers having to go and pull a sample from 32 bags throughout the lot, probably two locations per bag. That's even more specific best practice. You know, that's a lot of work, but as roasters, we're paying a lot for this coffee too and we deserve to it's very true. I, I almost wore my middleman t-shirt for this webinar because <laughs> I have one from an importer. I think um, a lot of the time um, if you come to coffee and you're new and you come to it from the consuming end, you have no idea the amount of work that goes into creating a specialty coffee lot and maintaining its quality as a specialty coffee lot before it even reaches you. And yeah. I have like literal firsthand knowledge of working um, in an importing company with warehouse people, talking to them, going to the warehouse and having to observe the amount of work that goes into to sustain the quality that you have asked for is immense. So yeah, yeah. I, I will happily pay for that because I can't do that. So. Yeah. And, it, and like, everything that you're saying and this whole talk about a representative sample, it, you know, it crops to be sort of think, I think at least in terms of like themes, right? So for like the next few months, I really want us to be focused at Cropster by talking about consistency. So next month we'll have a roast webinar where we talk about consistency. I think this session today is also kind of dipping our toes into that. Um, and yeah, to, to echo your comment about being on the consuming side, what I do think consumers want, even if they can't express it, is they want it, their coffee to be consistent. They want it to be consistent more than they want it to be delicious, right? <laughs> it's Absolutely. why most companies it's like a blend um, or kind of a house coffee is the best seller because it's much more likely that that's going to be consistent as opposed to a, 
rotating single yeah. opinion. And it's not just consistency in terms of quality. They want consistency specifically for their palates because for the, for the most normal consumers of coffee, they are not experimenting. They are not exploring. <laughs> they are just drinking a cup of coffee in the morning. So that's why we all the, do the discrimination cuppings to get our, you know, our blend components to mm -hmm. recreate the exact same blend year round. Um, yeah. Consistency to me is the cornerstone of good coffee at every, every point in the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, and when we talk about this physical analysis of green coffee, kind of really where it all starts, um, right? This is this is all stuff that we do before we ever put the coffee in a roaster and cup it, and it really starts with like a pretty hard look at the coffee, right? It's like looking at the color, and this is part of the protocol in the Wash Coffee Guide. It's like, is it? blue green or bluish green or green greenish yellow green pale yellow yellowish or brownish you know because that you know for one from lot to lot from sample to sample from bag to bag it should be consistent but also you know it's an indication that the coffee is reasonably fresh that it was stored well um any comments on that and us on the importance of color yeah so basically color um is an effect, um, I, I consider it a dual effect of um, organic material and moisture content. Mm -hmm. And as your coffee, I mean, fresh coffee can run a, run a gamut of colors, but it's a gamut of colors between blue, green, and green. Um, right. That's for washed Arabica. So let's just um, keep reiterating that these standards of washed Arabica are not the newer forms of honey or natural, or not new natural, but you know what I mean? Anything that's not washed, yeah. It needs a different classification system because this obviously your your natural coffees can come in looking kind of orangey um, or yellow. Um, for washed coffee, it's it's specific to um, the greens and blue greens, and the reason for this is as coffee ages, it loses moisture, and I mean age can happen due to time or forced age due to bad storage. Um, yeah. It doesn't only lose moisture; it loses over time specifically organic material. And I remember Trish Rothgeb using the, the term loony, and so I use loony, lots of organic material. <laughs> and so if your coffee is looking paler and paler as it, as it goes on, it's losing organic material and moisture, which you're going to have to, um, if, you, you, if you have this coffee and it's in your inventory, you're going to have to kind of like calibrate for in terms of how you roast. So the profile that you, you were using at the beginning of having this coffee, um, and I would, I, I personally would um, advise you to green coffee check, not often, but you know, depending on your storage conditions, three to six to nine months after you get it and hit those points and then record them. As I was saying, data is important. Record them so you can see how your coffee is aging and know how to roast it. Yeah, and I would even say like, you know, living here in the Bay Area and you know, any of us that live in cities with expensive real estate, you know, we're probably not storing most of our coffee at our warehouse. It's coming you know, from a coffee warehouse. We're getting shipments every week, every couple months, whatever that frequency is. Yeah, so when, when a new bag of an old coffee arrives from the warehouse, that's a perfect opportunity to dig into it again and take a look. Um, because yeah, I mean, ultimately those characteristics could translate to the cup, but it's nice to know kind of going in what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, screen size is a funny one. I mean, that's another piece, right? Having a set of sorting screens and being able to sift it, that would be a very particular step to take. And, you know, the, the guide does have a standard for screen size, right? Um, it's a buyer's reference. It's not part of the grade specification, but they basically recommend that there shouldn't be more than a 5% variance from the contracted specification. So if you've yeah. gone to reference 1718, you know, 95% of your coffee should be captured by a 1718 mm -hmm. screen. Um, I actually think that's a really hardcore standard. I rarely find coffees that are within 5%. Yeah. I was rate. gonna say, like I I'd never I don't know of a coffee that's met that standard that's not East African, like Kenyan, probably. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's so extra sort of, you know, and even like looking at this, of course I can see variation. It's hard, and I think um, people um, often wonder about screen size. They're like, oh, we'll just record the screen size. This is imperative to me as a roaster. 
Um, first of all, screens, um, they're um, very, very uh, highly machined. Uh, they're one sixteenth of an inch for each screen. Um, and you can 3D print these, I've been told, but I've, I've not yet worked with one, but I would prefer to work with one that's machined so that the edges are so um, clear, I know, I know that my coffee is getting um, graded properly. For roasters, um, the screen size um, is, I believe, imperative. It may not be a standard that you need for green coffee in sort of a quality perspective, but again, knowing what you have before you put it in the machine is invaluable. If I know that most of my coffee is one size, I know how to roast it. If I know my coffee, and this happens a lot um, with Ethiopian coffees and maybe some of the Central Americans are multi, like have many more screen sizes because of heirloom varieties or, or what have you, I know that I'm going to have to take different avenues to roasting that coffee well. And that, that's invaluable information. Any data I can get from the green coffee makes me a better roaster. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we may approach this one a little bit differently when I'm making purchasing decisions and, and actually comparing a sample against the contract, I will run it through the sorting screens kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll be a little bit more ad hoc and spread out my sample and, and just make a visual assessment, like does this more or less look consistent or is there some variation? Um, and also, is it generally a larger bean or generally a smaller bean? Because that's gonna inform how I apply heat and choose a charge temperature and things in the roaster. We could have a whole session on bean size. I know. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it another time. Um, and of course, smell is, you know, another key characteristic. Um, and it's, and, and I, I'm curious to hear you talk about it, right? The standard is kind of pass fail. Like, does it smell yeah. clean or does it smell of something foreign? And um, again, this is washed Arabica because you get fruity pebbles out of your naturals and all kind of funk out of your honeys and you know, uh, new variants of fermentation. Um, the smell is really important because um, coffee is hydroscopic and water picks up um, odors very, very well. As you know, if you put anything in the fridge and you don't wrap it properly or the freezer, it'll come out smelling like everything else that's in the fridge or freezer, depending on the water content of what you put in there. Um, because water um, is always leaving the bean doesn't mean your odor <laughs> will leave the bean as well. So um, I had a, a conversation with someone who was basically, you know, really devastated. They had ordered their competition coffee. It was, they'd gone to origin. It was amazing and delicious and it cupped really well. And somebody had left it. Um, uh, outside the warehouse before it was being put on in and in origin before it's put on the truck to get into the container and the truck was running so the coffee smelled like diesel yeah I, I had a I had a container that was on a on a ship and it was at the top of all the containers were stacked right so it was one that was yeah. exposed it wasn't like one buried in the middle of that stack and one of the engines failed so you just had an engine on the ship just belching diesel all over this container for its entire transit. Same thing, it smelled like diesel. The bags in the middle were, were okay, right? Yeah. And were able to be salvaged and sort of sold according to the contract, but then we had to dispose of a lot of coffee. Yeah. And the smell can also tell you the age of the coffee too. So if you're unsure of the color of the coffee is giving you the right information, if you smell it and it smells a bit kind of like, I call it dry and dusty. It doesn't, you don't have that depth of really fresh vegetable, vegetal or kind of um, herbaceous or however you describe green coffee. For me, it's like garden peas and, and, and green grass. Um, it has so like a it fresh went, characteristic to it, right? Yeah. It smells like fresh and vibrant and lively. Exactly. If your coffee is not smelling like that, um, it can be either through age or through um, another form of storage that, you know, didn't, didn't give it the best start in life. Um, mm -hmm. So you really wanna be able to, to use smell and um, uh, color as good first-hand indicators where you don't really need any machinery whatsoever, any equipment, nothing. You can just judge from there. And that's your initial, that's for me is the initial pass fail of a coffee. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, color and smell, right? It's beautiful because they're totally analog and just reliant on your systems. Yeah. 
a lot of resources like you know because money and time are real mm -hmm. it's <laughs> You know, and, and other aspects of this, you know, of course, there's the moisture content. Let's come back to that. But let's talk about density, just because we're talking about sort of analog and simple to take measurements. I think bulk density is so important to take. It tells me a lot about how I want to roast that coffee. You know, there is a correlation, perhaps, between density and moisture, right? If I have the same lot of coffee and I'm measuring the moisture the day that it arrives, in my warehouse and I measure it nine months later and that density has somehow changed, well, guess what? It's lost organic material somehow. I bet that the moisture is gonna be lower too. Yeah, um, exactly. And I think it's really yeah. There's a measuring Sorry. cup, a cylinder and a <laughs> decent scale. I mean, this is a ridiculously decent scale, but it takes, you know, like you could do this with $20 worth of equipment. <laughs> it's true. And you learn how to do it in high school. Exactly. This, this, here's the formula for it, right? Like in this case, this is a graduated cylinder. It goes to 500 milliliters, but I measured it filled with water to the top multiple times. I know that this is 600 milliliters. When I fill this with coffee, right? I just take my coffee and just free pour it. There's like an ISO standard for this. Um, it's so simple, right? It's just grams per milliliter. Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's very simple. This, this slide shows you how to calculate it. It's really simple and incredibly important as all roasters know. Um, density for me goes hand in hand with moisture content. If I measure a coffee's density and it's quite high and the moisture content is high, I know how to treat that coffee in the roaster and I'm expecting it to give me a little um, trouble <laughs> with the water buffer to the heat uptake. Yeah. If I measure another coffee and the density is quite high, but the moisture content is quite low, I'm like, oh, this is a different battle. You've got a lot of sugars and a lot of carbohydrates in you, same thing. Um, and I'm going to need to really treat you differently from the moisture heavy coffee. So yeah. it gives me um, a lot more information if I use those two um, aspects together than if I just consider them alone. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's huge. Um, and there is a standard, right? The standard for moisture, that's 10 to 12% for washed Arabica coffees. Um, so important to be aware of, like these machines can be expensive, temperamental, hard to calibrate. Um, it's, it's one of those pieces of equipment that I tell roasters, it is a very nice piece of equipment to have, but given your budgets and things, it might be something that is on your your second tier wish list, you know, you can get by with opening if you trust your suppliers and your importers and your measuring density and you're taking a look at the coffee in these ways, you know, moisture is nice to have, but not required. And I, uh, I, I think of exactly like that about a moisture meter. If you can afford one, get it. And if you can't just wait a second because it's kind of expensive and you can get by without it. Your importer should also have these um, figures for you. Yeah. So you, you shouldn't have to buy this in the first instance. Yeah. Um, and, and we didn't include your water activity, but that kind of goes. I was about to say, the, the one I tell people to not bother getting is the water activity meter. It's a $3,000 machine at the very least for something that doesn't really need to be measured by most people. It's a really good indication of future shelf life. But if you're not buying in the volumes of, you know, I don't even know. <laughs> I, I like in order level level volumes, right? Because like if you're a roaster buying at those volumes, you're probably roasting through a container in a few days or a few weeks. But you know, if you're an importer and you're buying large spot lots and things, that's where you exactly. Yeah. And, and I think it's also somewhat misunderstood. So you know, we do have a standard. It's in the book. It's less than 0.7 water activity, but. Um, but it's, it's not well understood. I mean, Cafe Imports has been studying this and tracking water activity and trying to correlate it to cupping scores and roasting behavior for years. Yeah, we and haven't found a way that it correlates to anything other than age and shelf life right. storage. And yeah. I, I won't tell people to be afraid of it. I will be, I'd love to know if this actually is a thing or we've just been dancing around something that's unnecessary. 
but um uh, but I don't think you should be afraid of new things um I'm not telling you that because I'm telling all of us that um I don't think we should be afraid of, of trying out and figuring out if something works or doesn't but Honestly, having worked and analyzed coffee on a weekly basis for an importer um, from globally, um, we, I, it didn't affect the way that I roasted coffee and it, it wasn't something that really mattered to, to me, so. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, if, if this, to put water activity to bed, I'll just encourage folks if they're interested in learning more, um, Sustainable Harvest had a great webinar and some great articles. They're an importer um, that discussed water activity. You can also find work from Cafe Imports. And I know Royal also has some blog posts about it. So there's three importers that are thinking a lot about water activity where you can sort of get up to speed on current thinking. Um, Joseph here has a great question in the chat. Just, do um, you ever send samples to friends you trust to confirm that your equipment is calibrated correctly and then the second part is also a sort of a non-biased confirmation. Um, because I think yeah. even like the smell and the aroma, like, you know, of course I have a bias. I have a lot of money invested in this coffee. Um, I might be willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think that's great. You know, it's like coffee for the most part has been, not always, but often we're a very collaborative industry and you know, if you have friends in other cities or even friends in the same town that are collaborative in nature, like, yeah, bring them I in. Would, I would never tell someone not uh, to not collaborate. We have an industry where this is, and you're right, it's not always the case, but when it is, it works really well. And I know I've benefited from it immensely. Um, I, not to sound, <laughs> not to sound egotistical, just to sound experienced. I don't send my stuff out to other people um, to confirm my equipment or myself um, because um, I feel like I should know that by now. I, I, those days are gone for me, but I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. I think people coming together and collaborating, sharing you know, their ideas, their knowledge, and it, it can actually lead to a way better coffee and maybe some buying groups, you never know, but I do not. And, you know, and for things like just checking the equipment calibration and things, you know, I would be worried about my calibration if I was consistently getting a different reading on my yeah. voice track than my input is telling me. You know, somebody's equipment is out of calibration and it might be time to calibrate it. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than the fact that I like to taste coffees with other people, um, so sometimes I will intentionally like go to a different lab to cut the samples that I'm thinking of buying. Like, that's great. I still am gonna buy the coffee I wanna buy. Um, like I like to be the little Napoleon with these decisions. Um, but you know, just to dig a little bit into what, you know, how Cropster helps to organize some of this data, right? This is just the physical analysis stuff that we've been talking about. And you can see here for a sample, um, you know, we have some information on the left about the lab, the evaluator, the sample size. On the right, we have a summary of the screen sizes. Um, we don't have a defect count in there yet. I'll show you what those reports look like in a minute. But you can see I have moisture and water activity and density recorded as well. Um, so Candace, looking at this report, is there anything you might be concerned about? Uh, the moisture content? Yeah, 13%. I would not be super happy with that. Immediately. Um, what's the icon next to the water con the moisture content? That's water activity. Okay, so that to me is okay. And then, sorry, I don't know the icon next to that. Is that next density? to that is the icon for density. Okay, yeah, it's the water content that's bothering me. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's 13% of this. Above the standard, um, it could indicate that that coffee is not going to store very well, or it could be more susceptible to um, you know, absorbing foreign odors or mold or things like that. Yeah, exactly. Mold is the other, I mean, everything we've talked about so far has only been to look at the getting the best out of that coffee for the roaster. Um, we haven't talked about, and I will talk about this, the actual um, mold and fungus, which yeah. are harmful. <laughs> yeah, and they can spread, right? It's like, I. Yes. it's a hard thing to train towards because most labs will not have a moldy coffee sample 
Exactly. And it spikes sets when you're taking your cue or doing your training because they don't want that mold to spread to other coffees. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not. What if you have a sample as a cue instructor and you spike it with a moldy a bean or two, the whole thing is going to get moldy. So yeah, exactly. Um, right. So you know, this let's get into this sort of actual green grading now, where we're actually looking at defects. Right. We've already talked about the protocol requires three hundred and fifty grams. This is the standard, and we can't. Read this home enough. It's on the title of the book. It is washed Arabica coffees that this applies to. Um, yeah. From a practical standpoint, it doesn't mean that I'm not using this same book and using the same protocol to look at naturals and honeys and pull and um, wet yeah, hold coffees and anaerobic coffees and all of this. It just means that I sort of hold them to a slightly different standard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, if anybody is uh, um, old like me, they may have the old version of this book, which is kind of a landscape flip book, um, which actually I found really useful to take into the field. So I still have mine, but I also do have a copy of the this one as well. Um, they're it's practical. like an A4 size. It's not yeah. very portable. <laughs> it's not as friendly yeah. because it doesn't always show like defects right next to descriptions. Sometimes it goes multiple. So I actually prefer the old version, but this is also available as a PDF download. Yeah. So yeah. not that we're, you know, we're not here to pitch the SCA, but the SCA website is where you can buy this book as either a PDF or a physical copy. And a PDF is fine. Yeah, I think for, yeah, for, for most people's purposes, a PDF is, is good enough for this. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if they still sell the poster, but you know, I love wherever I'm green grading, I just have to up on the wall because it's like a shorthand for all of this so i know it's like it, it shows you it's down, if you've seen it down the middle you get all the physical um attributes and then everything else is around the side and it's a really useful thing i think to have in a lab so if yeah. you're not just staring at the book if you're um if you're grading a coffee you can just look up and like this and and kind of like double check yourself i found the poster really I know we sound like we're on their on their payroll. We're not on the payroll of the SCA. <laughs> <laughs> but they are that, that is where we have the standards committee for this. And, yes, exactly. and we can thank them in the early days for developing these protocols and moving us away from commercial coffee that would have just had like at grade, below grade, and above grade. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we have, what we're gonna look at as Candace goes through the presentation, this is a chart right from the book. And this basically shows how the system works, where it's listing all of the defects you might find. Um, and it tells you what you know, we call it the defect equivalence. So not all defects are equal. So in the case of like fungus damage, if I have one bean, I count that as one defect. But if I have some beans that are chewed up and that have severe insect damage, well, until I have five beans, I don't count that as a defect. Yeah. If I have nine beans, I count it as one defect. But as soon as I get to 10, I count it as two. Yeah, we always round down because we love the farmers. Yeah. So that's what, I, that's what I teach my students as a Q instructor. We're not here to penalize. We're here to get great coffee. And the way to do that is just give people the information that they need to make better coffee. Yeah. So um, penalizing a lot of coffee by going above um, when you don't need to um, is uh, not not a thing, not a thing we do. Yeah, and I think it's important oh, to um, add on to what Marcus was saying. There are um, egregious defects, and these are in the primary defect um, category one, um, and there are less egregious defects, and they're in category two. Category one defects, apart from um, severe insect damage, are one to one. So it's one whole, one bean equals one defect. However, the reason there's a fraction system is the effect on your cup. So if you have um, a black bean in your, you know, French press, it's going to be far more egregious to your cup taste than if you have a few um, insect damaged beans. And yeah. that's the same for the secondary defects. You'll have them go three to one all the way down to 10 to one. So a partial black here, you'll see you'll need three of those. And I'll tell you um, as we proceed um, how, how you count that um, will be one secondary defect. However, you need 10 
slight inset damage to get one secondary defect. So as Mark is saying, if you had nine, that's zero defects. But if you have 10, it becomes one defect. And, and also just the order of the defects on the list, right? Because we will find beams that are say broken, but also have, um, but also maybe have a partial black element to them. Well, you always, you wouldn't double penalize it. You would simply penalize it for the defect that fell further up on the list. Yeah, um, exactly. So I had a broken and withered bean, I would count it as a withered bean. Yeah, um, exactly. So just kind of a detail. Um, and you can see here also, um, when you add all of this up, um, a specialty coffee shouldn't have any category one defects and should have no more than five category two defects when you do all of the math from the fractions. Exactly. And people get really confused. Like if it's got five um, secondary defects as beans, that, that, must be, that, that must be it. It's like no count the fractions. You can have, if you're looking at severe insect damage, you can have um, 50 of those before it becomes a problem for the quality of the coffee. Slight insect damage, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, slight insect damage, my bad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and this is that sort of math piece that I think really makes the supply to washed Arabica. You know, like if I, I know that a natural coffee hasn't been sorted as highly and I'm going to be more forgiving, you know, I, we don't have the math for it. We don't have the standard for it. So you have to make that up for yourself. But, you know, I might find many more beans that are penalized in these categories than a coffee that isn't a washed coffee. Yeah. And I might allow that, depending on how the coffee counts. It's true. Um, this is the score sheet from the SCA. This is also available for members to download um, and print and use for yourself. You can see it's that same chart. It has a place to record sample information at the top, your bean count, and then the resulting math, the defect count. Beside that, a place to record moisture and some ambient temperatures and things. Um, so you have this to file away. If you do the queue, it'll be a version of this that you would be used in your yeah. tests. Um, this is how Cropster does it. Oh, do you want to just go really quickly? I just wanted to talk about the bottom of the form. This used to be two separate forms. It's now one form. The top of the form is green grading. The bottom of the form is roasted grading. Roasted grading is simply a defect, um, a Quaker count. Uh, zero Quakers if it's an SCA standard. However, three Quakers if it's um, a um, Q standard. And that's for 100 grams. So yeah. for your green grading, you grade 350 grams. And if you want to grade roasted coffee, it's only 100 grams. So it's all, all of it's on the bottom of that sheet. And just to let you know that you can use it for two things. When I was um, heading up a roasting um, and QC lab, I would always have but long, long before computers. I'm joking, but I would always have um, my cupping sheet, my green grading form, and any other notes per coffee in a little plastic wallet, so that I would always have the information on that coffee before you know databases and all that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, grading, yeah, that's important. Quakers absolutely contribute to off flavor. That could, and again, be a whole other course. Um, but again, like, you know, just be mindful. You know, like, I, I used to work with like the, the great uncle of geisha coffee, William Booth. And, you know, geisha coffees often have a lot of Quakers. And yeah. that sucks when it's a $200 a pound coffee, but um, you just get rid of them before you sell it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, then this is how Cropster calculates it. You see it's the same form. Um, Cropster does the math for you. So you just have to type in the number of beans that you find, and then it does the equivalence. Um, so it's a pretty simple data entry, sample by sample. And then when all is said and done, it can generate these types of reports that are so easy to send to your suppliers. Um, you know, and as somebody who has worked very closely with farms, I mean, this is a, this, this report here represents a cooperative that um, I was there for the birth of, so I'm very close to these women. Um, but you know, like this kind of report is so valuable because if they have this book, and Candace will talk about this in a bit, 
it tells you not just what the defects are, but what the possible causes are. Um, mm -hmm. And also like it, we're, we're not getting into like the cupping of the coffees and so on in this session, but the beauty of this green grading is that it is an objective standard. If I grade a coffee, if Candace grades a coffee, if another Q grader at an export hub in Rwanda is grading this coffee, you know, if it was the same sample, we should get the same results. And it's like kind of irrefutable. Um, and it can be backed up so simply with like a photo from your cell phone. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to, it lends more credence to coupling and the objectivity of cupping, which is a subjective act made objective. Um, because this is such an objective standard. Yeah, it's true. Um, it, the, this point, I mean, Joseph was talking about, do you send your coffees out? No, but I do try and find out if someone with the same lot of coffee, if I'm having a problem with it, before I speak to my importer, I can talk to them and double check with them about the quality of coffee they received. And if they have their data um, as well organized as I do, it gives me a lot of confidence and then going to the importer and saying, hey, actually I didn't receive what I paid for. And that's really important to know that we green grade not just for ourselves, but we green grade to ensure that we're getting the quality of coffee that we ordered in our contracts. It's, mm -hmm. um, you, we all know that um, contracts can give you, you can write in different standards that you need or want, but if you have that, um, the, the, if it, it's called specialty coffee, unless you have specifically talked to the importer, it must meet these standards. So yeah. it's, a, it's a very black and white way to kind of like deliver information and get what you need. Yeah. I'm um, thinking of a little time left to run through some of the, the defects. Yeah, I think we should. I mean, we have, you know, sort of like 10 minutes left on the calendar. We can go a little bit long if we need to. I asked Candace to, um, to share the CQI, the Coffee Quality Institute presentation on green grading. Um, Let me just. Up. And there is a request from Joseph here. Maybe Hannes can um, can make this happen to um, make sure that the Cropster screen has the primary focus. Because um, I think while Candace goes through showing you some of the photos of these defects from the book, I'm going to actually grade this sample. Um, so I'm not sure which one is more important to have on the focus. Maybe um, our director, Hannes, can kind of switch back and forth a little bit as I read the sample. Are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. So um, I'm not going to whiz through these, but I won't, I'm not going to give the full like blow by blow lecture because uh, it's a long, um, but Full black is one of the um, defects that people recognize most because they're black and they're in the middle of a pile of green beans and they're very easy to see. They also look very devastating when you see them because they're very, um, they're, it, there's no kind of like shade of green, there's no sort of um, opaqueness to it, um, or sorry, translucence to it. It's, um, it's a, it looks like a, a foreign object almost. Um, they, is black because I think the famous way that I had one, in, one of my instructors describe it, like, Black is black, like this photo shows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if it looks black, it's a black bean. <laughs> like, and this is, um, it's quite a it's, a, it's a category one, one to one defect, literally because it can have so many egregious effects on the cup. You can, um, the taste of it varies, uh, fermented. Um, you can taste much like acetic acid. It can taste musty or earthy. It can taste moldy, um, damp, sour, and the one that I hate the most is phenolic. Um, I, it has, it can have um, a terrible effect on your cup, just one bean. I do know that people have brewed cups of black beans and only found them musty. And they're like, well, why doesn't it taste as bad as the phenolic one or this? It's because black bean, um, the results um, are the result of many different uh, causes. We, there's no one cause for um, having black beans. And not just that, they're an ocrotoxin risk. That's a microtoxin which can devastate your immune system. It affects uh, grains mostly, and most ports will check your um, agricultural uh, load before you're even allowed to um, uh, take any of the containers off the ship because 
they won't accept it if it has aquatoxin in it. It's, um, it can devastate a community um, and decimate, as in 10%, not the hyperbole, but as 10% of a community can be taken out by illness. So you can prevent these, and therefore it's important that you share these because farmers can prevent these, or at least prevent um, as many as they can by picking right uh, fruit and not um, overly um, ripe fruit, avoiding over fermentations during processing, um, and then removing them immediately when they become apparent in the um, dry husk, um, hollow, sorry. Um, I don't so have four blacks in this sample, Candice, but I did pick up, um, I don't know if we can see it on my camera here. This one's easier. I did pick up a broken bean or severe insect damage bean that's also black. So, so. Um, that would be a, and, and I would call it a full black because more than 50% of the bean exactly. has this discoloration. I think it's more than, it, it's, um, it, it's difficult to uh, assess uh, what should be a full or partial black. A yeah. full black should be pretty much full, but it can have a slight amount of green. Um, I would say if it's 50%, as you said, it's partial black, so. Okay, it's, I mean, I'm just, yeah, the classification says one bean greater than or equal to half black equals one full defect. Yeah. So that's it's going to half. It's hard to assess half. I mean, that would, okay, I think it was, a, I think it was two thirds of one bean. Yes. Um, the next um, defect we're looking at is full sour. And this one tricks a lot of people. Um, full or um, sour beans um, or partial sour uh, produce a really sour kind of acetic um, flavor or it can actually be fermented like over ferment flavor depends on the degree of, of, of the sourness that the bean has taken up. It, um, people often confuse this. I'm going to give you what it looks like and what it's not. It looks opaque almost like milk glass. It doesn't look like there's any green bean at all. It looks almost as though you've made it from a different substance, it's a different bean. This can often get confused, especially with people who are not used to seeing them, um, or even people who are, um, with what we call foxy beans. Foxy beans are beans where the silver skin is, adheres incredibly tightly to the bean, and it also has a reddish brown color. Now, one of the very high tech um, and very expensive pieces of machinery you can use to assess whether this is a foxy bean or a sour bean is your fingernail. So if you find one of these beans, just scratch it. And if the brown or red um, color comes off, then it's just a foxy bean and it's fine. And that's, once you, once you see enough of them, and I hope you don't, it'll become very apparent the difference between the two. Yeah, this, this bean that I pulled out and was showing, um, I thought that it could perhaps be a foxy bean, but mm. I scraped it, I, even, I actually cut it with a knife and it is this color, this sort of opaque characteristic all the way through. And this one even has a slightly sour aromatic to it when you smell the bean. I always smell, yes, exactly. So see, smelling your beans, very important. This is also an aquatoxin um, risk. So don't, don't roast these if you find them in your, um, in your coffee. Um, take them out and maybe if there's a lot of them, definitely speak to your importer. Yeah. Foreign matter is very much a one-to-one -one defect. Here's a rock that I pulled out of this sample, a nice stone that's about the size of three or four coffee beans. Oh my God. Yeah. And what's the craziest thing you've ever found in your coffee? Like an entire container where probably 20 or 30 of the bags had broken machetes in them. Are you serious? Oh my yeah, God, like, I was getting ready to be the most impressive person with my bullets and my um, the top of someone's finger bone. Yeah, I think it was a mill and somebody was clearly like stealing coffee out of the mill and making yeah. it the last weight with like broken agricultural equipment. That's um, insane. Yeah. <laughs> well, the reason this is a primary defect is A, um, you shouldn't be consuming anything that's not consumable. And B, it will ruin your machinery. It will ruin your roaster. It will definitely ruin your grinder. Um, it is not desirable to the cup quality of your coffee. So, yeah. 
Mm. Popcorn, like every couple of months, somebody oh, checks yeah. me. Oh, I found popcorn in my coffee. I mean, that one's probably not going to kill you or make you sick or hurt your equipment. <laughs> I eat the popcorn. That's that in the <laughs> What's that? I eat the popcorn that comes out in my roaster. Yep. I know I shouldn't, but I do. <laughs> um, this uh, you'll very likely not see. Um, fungus um, is again highly regulated. Um, because it can make you very sick. So um, a really easy, this is, this is a little hint that I shouldn't be giving for the cue. If you see a bean that looks kind of mottled and kind of ridged like that, try and see whether those colors or those um, um, kind of like weird defects in the bean are actually on top of the bean. Because fungus grows on green coffee. It's not a part of green coffee. So a lot of people have put their hand up in class and been like, I found a fungus bean. I'm like, you did not find a fungus bean. And then we cut it in half and show that it's not, it's actually just the bean itself. Yeah, um, often, so like, especially with like wet hold coffees, right? Or yeah. like very high water activity coffees, you'll see like a little white spot that's just kind of water coming to the surface and I've seen a lot of folks mistake those for Exactly. Thank you for that. I did forget that. So it's kind of, they look like reddish brown or kind of like whitish brown um, uh, powdery spots and the spots are spores. You, could, you, you will be able to tell it. Um, so don't overgrade your beans. Yeah. Um, and you can see here what I'm doing is I've just laid out my beans and I just flipped them. You know, it's like when I do this, I'll take 15, 20 minutes often to go through. And I, um, you know, and I'll kind of file them up, spread them around, then turn them, make sure I'm looking at multiple sides. So that's what I'm, what I'm up to here while Candace is talking. I grade in two parts. I'll grade things that I immediately see very quickly yes. um, as not perfect. And I'll put the beans that I'm very confident about to the side and things that um, I will then regrade the beans. And more often than not, I've overgraded. And so I push those to the side because they're not you know, perfectly whatever. But it's important to make sure that when you grade, you're not overgrading or undergrading. Yeah, I, I guess I do it in sort of three steps. I'll find the obvious stuff right away. Yeah. Then I'll go back and be like very detailed. And then I'll go back to what I pulled out and then kick things back into my pile. Because yes. you know, it's. I think it's also important to to note that you know, just because it's ugly doesn't mean it's a defect. If it's not defects yeah. listed, don't we, be uh, okay. We say that about dating. You know, dating is like grading coffee. Ugly is not a defect. <laughs> it's very bad. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, cherry pods are a primary defect because they connote um, bad processing at the farm, and also you can't drink unprocessed coffee. So those will come, um, I usually give feedback to producers or through importers to producers about things. I grade every coffee, I regrade every coffee I get um, because it's helpful for them to know that maybe their, um, their huller is out of um, calibration. So yeah. there's things that you can tell um, and feedback you can give in terms of the defects you receive. And it's actually really helpful to a producer who's trying to do well or doing things differently or it, you know, didn't, didn't realize. Um, and that's, um, that's a part of the, the trust relationship that can be really beneficial to you as, as, as a coffee, um, a roaster or a, a coffee person. Yeah. I'm going really quickly because I know we're out of time, but I do want to talk about um, the fact that the insect uh, that we uh, talk about in terms of insect damage is usually the berry borer beetle. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. It's me. Oh, that. The berry borer beetle is a tiny little beetle that um, actually doesn't go into the bean. It goes into the cherry and then into the bean. It's female, um, usually if it's doing this, and it, go, it drills its way into um, through the cherry, eating that for fuel into the bean to lay its eggs. It will lay its eggs in there and then usually leave. If it doesn't die on the way out, it will leave the, the bean. And it, the cherries will then continue to grow. And you really cannot tell because the, the growing cherries are um, self-healing that this has happened. So it's only until the coffee is um, 
uh, de um, depult and process and hold that you'll find this um, defect. As you can see, it looks pretty darn ugly. And this is severe because you have this amount it's more than three holes, they say. I'm not sure um, if that's still true, but this has obviously had substantial insect activity. Um, the reason um, that it, I mean, it looks pretty ugly. Um, it doesn't taste too bad. Um, it can taste musty or moldy, but that's more of an effect of having an open um, coffee bean and coffee cherry and having water damage and other things such as that. Um, but it will impact your roasting and cup quality because the beans are far less dense than they should be and won't behave as that you want them to in the roast or the brewer. Yeah, it, it is still um, three or more perforations. And, it's, you know, and I, and I think, you know, this is actually a great picture because you can see clearly the sides where like half the bean has been chewed away. But that, that bean on the upper right corner, you can see what looks just like a very small like pinhole kind of just against the border. That's often all that you will see in a, like in a slight insect damage bean, exactly. which is one tiny hole. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do want to, you know, we can keep talking about this, but I do want to show a little bit about what I have pulled out of this sample here quite a lot, including a rock, a sour, a black, parchment, another partial black, a lot of immature. You know, from a pragmatic standpoint as a roaster that's very busy, if I was looking at this sample and I had 15 other samples that I had to evaluate to make a purchasing decision, I probably wouldn't have even spent this much time. Yeah. I would have gone through that initial look at the coffee, I would have picked out the most serious issues that I found and pretty quickly said, okay, let's move on to another sample. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a pragmatic approach. The part of me that loves coffee farmers and has worked very closely with farmers wants to get every coffee all of the time in the world. But, mm -hmm. um, but again, just speaking sort of pragmatically and practically, that's not always possible. Yeah, it's true. And it's, it's true. If, if you're busy and you have a lot to do, you can make that assessment very quickly after, you know, knowing these standards for a while. Yeah. Um, and it, it makes the timing, um, the time that you have to spend much smaller, but spending that time in the beginning is really um, important, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to, to, to learn this, it just takes putting forth the effort. Um, mm -hmm. So let me whiz through. Um, with inter defects. Sorry, yeah. Partial sour. Right. Joseph is asking if you would give yourself a time limit. Um, absolutely. Yeah. When you're first learning this, it's going to take a lot more. But now, if I'm really sitting down to green grade samples, I'll give myself like a 15 to 20 minute time limit. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty fast at this. I know that I can get most things in 15 to 20 minutes and give the coffee a fair shake. But might I miss a couple of immature and unripe or one or two withered beans that are hiding out or one or two insect damage beans? I might, um, but also I know personally that I can, um, I can be very accurate in that time. And I even make students, like I make them set a time where when they're first learning this, I give them half an hour. As they get better, I give them 20 minutes because it's one way to keep them from over grading, which I think is yeah. more common than missing. The more time you spend with the coffee, the more you are in danger of overgrading that coffee. I also set the timer for 20 minutes. It's kind of a standard for Q and SCA. Yeah. That's what you're doing with the Q. You have one hour to grade three samples, so 20 minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you only get 20 minutes if you finish early. 20 minutes for <laughs> the next one, not 30. And then I went to Guatemala and the ladies were doing the work in about three minutes that I did in 20. So then I went home and felt very um, yep. less proud of myself than I did before. Um, these are quite, yeah, I think you've, you've, we've seen the, 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 more, the, the full defects to these. So I'll just show you the partial black and what it looks like, the partial sour and what it looks like. So remember, see that reddish brown that we call foxy if it's not a sour. That's why a lot of people get confused. 
Um, the cherry hull and husk is a secondary defect to the cherry pod and again connotes issues with the, uh, the huller. Um, these beans, not very pe many people um, have seen. Um, they're very easy to see and even easier to detect. They're low densities, that's why they're called floaters. And what you do is stick them in a glass of water and if they float, then they're not good. <laughs> that's it. Um, immature beans, this is a terrible picture and I really hate this picture. So just kind of try to ignore it. Immature beans do not look like Frankenstein. They don't look like they're weird and, and, and kind of shriveled up like this in a, in a kind of odd way. Um, immature beans basically look concave. They've, they have sharp edges, they're small, um, and they're usually kind of a pallid color to whatever um, the regular color is. So if it's a, a greenish color, then it might be yellow, green, and so on and so forth. In addition to this, the silver skin is so tightly attached to the bean that you really can't take it off. Um, but it's those sharp edges and the concaveness will show you the immature bean. Um, and I unfortunately received an entire sample of coffee that was all immature beans. Um, it was quite sad. Um, oh, with a bean, this, this sample is loaded with them. Um, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's because people don't pick it up very quickly. Immature, yeah. um, Sorry, um, immature beans can look exactly, if you're to, to untrained eye, look exactly like a regular coffee bean. Yeah. And, um, and I just want to say, Candice, you, you gave a perfect description of what I look for also with the mature beans. And for those of you that don't have 15, 20 years of experience with this, the booklet doesn't just have these photos, it actually gives you a physical description of this issue, you know? so. Um, you can reference that, you know, this is a page for immature beans and the physical description is here. Because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, but sometimes like a hundred words is worth more than the picture you can ever show. So it's both looking at the photos, but also understanding the description. Yes. Um, so immature beans obviously are because the beans are harvested too early, so that's easier. Withered beans, um, people always try to show me withered beans that aren't withered. Withered beans are um, an effect of drought um, or low water uh, management um, in, the, in the growing stage. They look like raisins, they really do. And with both immature and withered beans, you need to use your, I would say the pad of your thumb to detect the, the kind of physical um, attributes you might not be able to see. So with the immature beans, we talked about sharp edges and con concave um, face. The withered beans look like raisins. They are shriveled and they're shriveled because what has happened is as the bean hasn't received the water it needs from nature or from farming management, it then starts to cannibalize itself for the water. And the, um, these beans at one point would have been uh, puffy and, and normal grown. Um, and they're withered due to the lack of, of water. Um, they can taste kind of like herby or kind of greenish um, and, or hay-like, just depending on the quality of the actual coffee itself. Um, parchment means that you have a problem in your dry mill. Um, you shouldn't be receiving parchment covered beans. They should have been hulled off. Um, after reposado, um, so it's although it's not a bad defect. I often, I don't ever do this um, in commercial roasting, but sometimes I pick off the parchment um, and stick the beans in the the roaster if I'm just roasting for myself. You don't don't have to tell anyone that. Um, the elephant ear or the shell are one of the most fun things if you can get them together. So. If I come off sharing screen for a second and show you as I do in class, um, an elephant ear, so beans grow like this, two beans face to face in a cherry pod. Mutations of this can be the peabury, where it grows as one single bean in a cherry pod that's folded over. You can also get triangle beans, that's three beans in a cherry pod. Elephant ears or shells grow like this, where one bean has grown over like this, the other, and it's one bean in a cherry pod. Now, the reason this is a defect is because you can do this with your fingernails and actually pry them apart. They're low density. 
So the more of these you have in your lot and you don't see them or you don't know that they can be pulled apart, you put them in your roaster, you're not going to get the coffee quality that you expect or, or asked for. Almost done. Let's go. Sorry, I'm trying to trying to navigate technology with um, an insane dog um, next to me who is refusing to not let me pay to, to make me pay fetch. <laughs> and thank you for our attendees. I know we're going just a little long, but I, yeah, so sorry. Looks like everyone's hanging in there because I think that this is interesting and important to get a look at this. And super important. Maybe somebody's tempted to to come out and take a Q course with you, Candice, that would be cool next time. I, have, I am planning one, um, hopefully in the spring. So keep posted. <laughs> <laughs> so this, one, um, awesome. this shows you the insides and this shows of uh, so the shell, and this shows you the inside, the elephant ear that, that usually is married to one of They're usually by um, the hullers, um, or yes, they're by the hullers, and not being calibrated, those hullers can, um, rollers can be very tight, oh. and the beans are quite soft, um, and they will, um, they will get mashed in a ba badly calibrated huller. Now we can tell this is in the wet mill because there's water damage, and those black spots are water damage um, oh. over moisture in the, um, in the, in the, in the uh, getting into the beans. Sorry, my dog. Um, and then this one is in the dry mill. So you can see there's none of that kind of gross kind of um, black discoloration, but the effect and the damage is the same. Uh, these won't necessarily badly affect your cup taste um, in small amounts, but they will affect the way that you roast. I think that might be it. Yeah, that's kind of it. And, and yeah, Candice, thank you so much because I think you're you're really the last piece of this is right. The next step would then be to prepare to sample those those coffees that you're interested in pursuing. Yes. And you want to put these defective beans back into the coffee before you sample roast them, with yes. a few exceptions where, if you know you think there's going to be a health risk from okra toxin, um, um, yeah. You've effectively now sorted, and like in my case here, I've cleaned this coffee up. If I were to just roast this, I'm not actually tasting what I would be purchasing. So I would need yeah. to put all of these defects back in, um, not the stone, so that I can taste the coffee as as it was sent to you. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of people make that mistake. They grade the coffee, take everything out, and then sample roast that. And like, this is a great coffee. It's like no, that 350 gram sample is a great coffee. <laughs> yep. <coughs> exactly, exactly. Um, well, now is our chance if folks have any questions that they should chime in and ask and Candice and I can kind of wrap us up. Um, while you ask questions, I'll also put this slide up because if you do want to see more about how Cropster can handle samples and green grading and sort of assessing your quality over time. Um, here's the link where you can scan the QR code and you can book a demo with one of my colleagues right away. But Candice, this was awesome. Um, Thank I'm you. really keen to do more of these kinds of webinars where there's some hands-on elements. So yes. I think there's some like, roasting sessions as well while we're talking <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> I've, never done, I've never actually hosted a webinar while I'm roasting. Uh, I don't know if it's a good idea if I do. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Joseph, um, thank you so much for your comments. You are super engaged. You always are when we have these webinars, and I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, and uh, you're, yeah, no, Marcus, you're like a model, you're model customer, a model student. <laughs> he's gonna be. Marcus will be flying us to New Zealand. Don't worry, Joseph. Very soon. Like, <laughs> My brother lives there. I, I'm due a visit. I shall have to come. <laughs> no, it sounds like um, you could find some students if you wanted to build that into a, a training course, right? I could, yeah. I need to. Uh, I need to get out there. I need to. I'm on my way to getting my um, my Loring Advanced Trainer with my little apron. I really want that suit. 
Uh, so I need to kind of sort that out and get that done this year. Um, and then uh, come visit everybody. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Candice, this was great. Thank you so, so much for joining oh, me today. You. And um, thanks to everybody who had attended. If you want to catch up on this further, um, we do have a blog post on green grading also on our website at cropster.com. Um, they're the articles section. Um, I wrote it so you very much get sort of my pragmatic approach to this. Um, keep that in mind. But also we will, we've been recording this session and we will post this on our um, YouTube channel and post it on our website too. So you can go back to it or share it with your colleagues um, for future reference. So great. Well, thank you everybody. Thanks, Candice. Thanks, Hannes, for being our fearless um, producer.